Chief Patrick uh, Butler basically also spoke, and he is fluent, and I mean fluent in Spanish. And, and so it was kind of nice where, you know, where, where Chief Lorenzo was able to, you know, understand everything that had gone on prior uh, in really uh, eloquent and articulate. You know, I, I've kinda stu I can't speak Spanish that well, but I certainly know good Spanish when I hear it. In, in fact, he speaks Spanish Spanish, not Mexican Spanish. Oh, like Castilian. Yeah, Castilian yeah, Spanish. Um, and... Uh, Although apparently uh, he's half Irish and half Mexican, as I understand it, uh, but but his Spanish is uh, Castilian Spanish. <laughs> That's very good. Very good. Oh, uh, a few weeks ago, we had the opportunity to hear from um, Chief Vitovich. He's not here today, is right now. Yeah. Anyway, uh, people from his shop came and did a. Um, presentation on uh, emergency preparedness for seniors they have a and they worked with my safe LA and they have a beautiful presentation for 55 year olds and older that's geared just for them it's it's interactive it's the color for the videos are beautiful they get real big screens so that people who are that age could actually see it uh, and people were very, very impressed. Uh, we had about 100 uh, people there, and uh, they're still talking about that, saying that should be one of our regular presentations every year. I told them we could not guarantee them smoke alarms every year, but we could do a presentation. <laughs> so that was, that was um, I was really happy with that presentation. Um, also, we had uh, one firefighter who volunteered to come with the group, uh, Firefighter Williams. I'm not sure where he's from. Anyway, he came and he helped uh, help with the presentation also. Um, and it happened to be that his mother is a member of our group, a retired teacher. Uh, and it was really kind of a great presentation because some of the other people there who were presenting also had attended some of our public schools. And of course, when you have a whole group of retired teachers, you know, they can all associate with one school or another. Also, I was very happy to hear about the uh, Fire Station 81. Thank you, Chief. I'm sure that you helped to make sure that happened. And uh, I haven't had a chance to speak to them yet, uh, but I'm sure that they're happy that they have a uh, new uh, coverage for the ground out there. So thank you very much for that. Uh, just uh, briefly, I, uh, uh, several weeks back, I uh, had a great um, ride along with Fire Station 57s, and I wanted to thank them for hosting me for dinner. I think uh, 57s, to me, it's one of our most interesting uh, places in the um, in the city because I think they they really you know you have uh, a station designed for one one, one engine and uh, one ambulance, and they have I think 14 people there now. It's been one engine and, and three rescues now, um, or four rescues. I'm not even sure. But, um, but, but there was an interesting sort of glimpse into, uh, you know, our what we may discover in our standards of cover in terms of, uh, you know, how we're deploying resources and um, and also just the you know the, the, the changes that kind of accidentally happen when you have, uh, you know, it's, it's a captain one assigned, but he's actually supervising the same number of people as a task force. Um, I think those those are some really interesting things that that we will continue to probably grapple with over the next couple of years as we continue to evolve. It's also they have a gallery which is uh, uh, an homage to uh, Chief Flegel in his younger years. Uh, so uh, I don't think he's here, but uh, I got I got a little time warp to see what Chief Flegel looked like uh, when he was a firefighter. So uh, that was nice. But uh, thanks again to that that uh, group for letting me ride out with him. Well, Madam President, one other thing that happened. I went to the uh, State of the City speech. Right. And thanks to a battalion chief from the valley, I can't remember his name, Chief Elder. Chief Elder, I was able to get in in a timely manner and find a parking place. Uh, but I was very impressed with the mayor's presentation and speech because he mentioned the fire department in very positive ways. Um, he had lots of comments to say about that were positive about the fire department. So I thought that was a really good speech, along with a lot of other things that were in it. But because he did highlight the fire department and his increased services to them and their increased um, uh, response times and a lot of other things he's getting from the computer systems, which is really good. Okay, so that's Commissioner Comments. 
Uh, moving on to item two, which is report of the fire chief to its announcement meeting. Thank you, Madam President. On April 8th, I attended Mayor Garcetti's Sustainable City Plan press conference, and it's related to what you said, Commissioner Woods Gray, about uh, drought resistant landscaping. Uh, fire Station 81 is an example of a sustainable uh, initiative, and we're trying to expand that throughout the department. The other thing we're doing is uh, including the purchase of hybrid vehicles for our inspectors and sustainability is a component of our strategic plan so we can support the mayor's efforts in that arena. The next day on April 9th, I got a phone call from Councilman Buscaino and he told me the house next door to him is on fire. And uh, I was on the freeway coincidentally heading towards San Pedro so I diverted to the fire and it was literally next door to his house. Our companies down there in Battalion 6 did a great job. We had an off-duty uh, captain, Captain Al Luna, who was at home, who actually uh, responded and went into the neighbor's house with a, a garden hose to ensure that everybody was out. Uh, captain Luna will be retiring in about two weeks, so I told him we're going to make him a hero before he leaves officially. So he did a great job. There was no injuries, and uh, our companies got there quickly. While at that location, I got a notification that a car had driven off the, the dock at Portsacol. So I responded to that, and it was quite a tragedy. It appears that a, uh, a parents uh, were in a vehicle with two young uh, kids in the back seat, and uh, the driver went off the dock and into the channel. Um, our boats got there quick. Uh, some of our responders from Fire Station 112 responded and jumped in without any dive equipment. Uh, they, Firefighter Miguel Meza made a valiant effort to try to get the kids uh, he didn't, was not able, it was 30 feet deep in that part of the channel. Um, so that was a very tragic event. Our divers got there very quickly. They dove and they extricated the kids from the vehicle. On April 11th, I attended the retirement dinner for Captain Greg Newland, very well attended. On April 14th, I also attended the Mayor's State of the City address at uh, CSUN. And he did reference the fire department, and he pointed out our call processing time uh, savings of 18 seconds due to our new tiered dis dispatch system. Uh, very, uh, it's attributed to Dr. Eckstein and, and the staff at uh, MFC, and they did a great job in creating that, that program for us. That same day, I went to LA Unified School District board meeting and talked about three things, the CPR uh, partnership, the Pulse Point app, and our high school magnet program. Uh, they passed a resolution, and we do have now an agreement with them on those three initiatives to work together to train high school students. And then lastly, yesterday, today, and tomorrow, um, I went to the COSEP, our Chief Officer Continuing Education Training Program. Uh, great training going on at Frank Hodgkins. They talked about high-rise incidents, uh, recent emergency incidents, and I gave them a current events update with the department. A lot going on, but it's all good, good uh, things for the department. Thank you. I, I, I really value that Pulse Point uh, app. That is really a very good thing. Thank you, Chief. He introduced me to that. And I really, I use it often in my neighborhood to see what's going on. It's great. Uh, moving on to 2B, it's a verbal report by the Department of Significant Incidents and Activities for the period of April 8th to April 12th, the 21st. Good morning, Madam President, Good morning. Commission, Chief, Council. Um, I just have one for the Valley that I'll speak about, and there's some video I'll have to show you in a second here. On um, April 16th, we had 89 firefighters. It took them 32 minutes to put uh, knock out a fire in a two-story apartment complex of 50 units. Two units were actually on fire on the second floor. Some of the uh, extension had dropped down to the first floor, causing a third unit to catch fire. Um, we ended up having um, uh, 19 adults and 12 children displaced. Uh, we contacted Red Cross to tie that loop, and we had three injuries. One was a female, adult, female, uh, minor burns, and two firefighters with uh, minor injuries. Uh, they were all transported. The smoke alarms were working, but I want to show you this video, kind of get a picture of a glimpse of what the firefighters were challenged with. This is the Panorama City one? Yes, this is the Panorama City. Come up and 
Just in closing, uh, the initial part of the fire which you saw was very intense. Uh, we just recently, uh, as recent as yesterday, in this training the chief was talking about, we introduced a different tactic, uh, transitional attack that we use, and that's, this would have been a great fire to actually demonstrate that on. You'll probably hear some more about that down the road. But thank you. Thank you. April 7th, I responded to a structure fire at uh, 1543 West Olympic. With flames raging, firefighters risked their lives to pluck two people out of uh, an office tower in inferno. I'm Michelle Tuzzi. I'm Mark Brown. Hundreds of firefighters swarmed the building, searching the tower room by room, floor by floor. Eyewitness News reporter Alex Michelson is live with more of the incredible pictures and the stories of rescue. Alex. Mark and Michelle, we are just a few blocks away from Staples Center. Our photographer, Sean Callis, was there covering a game. He was one of the first people to arrive on scene here, actually spotted the trapped couple and was the one who told firefighters about them, then witnessed some incredible rescues. As flames shoot out of an office building in the Westlake District, Ricardo Molina and his wife Vivian are stuck inside. With black smoke everywhere, Ricardo dials 911 and gasps for breath. I had to open all the windows because we were suffocating. Firefighters arrive within three minutes and extend a ladder. Vivian is the first one slowly taken down. What's going through your mind when you're going down that ladder? Uh, I just want to go home. Then it's Ricardo's turn to head down that ladder. I thought I, I wasn't going to make it. I had a bad heart problem. Eyewitnesses say it's inspiring watching the firefighters work. It was amazing. That makes me want to change my mind of being a firefighter. 170 firefighters from 30 different companies arrived to fight this blaze. A helicopter helps to provide light for the many firefighters on the roof. Others are inside the building, making sure everyone is all right. This building does not have sprinklers, and firefighters say that's legal. Buildings of this nature, sometimes they are not required to have sprinklers because of their age. Ricardo is treated for smoke inhalation by firefighters at the scene, but should be okay. What's your message to firefighters? Oh, right now I can say they're heaven sent. They did a great job. So a six-story building and a... Uh, when I uh, arrived on scene, six uh, windows of fire, quite a, an extensive fire. It took about uh, a, an hour to knock down the fire, and as uh, was indicated, about 170 firefighters. Um, uh, on the fifth floor of a six-story building, just uh, oven-like conditions and zero visibility as the firefighters entered from the stairwell. So a really difficult firefight and a real tribute to the firefighters for conducting the rescue and simultaneously uh, fire attack, and that was engineer John Libby doing the rescue up there on the on the fifth floor. So, yeah, you'll know him if you've ever been to Fire Station <laughs> Three. <laughs> Stands we in the did. mirror. Stands <laughs> in the mirror a lot. It's unforgettable. <laughs> uh, we had uh, one other uh, video we wanted to show you. It is actually the uh, incident that the chief uh, responded to at the ports of call. A real tragedy. I think the chief covered most of the uh, critical items. Of, of
The car was filled with four people inside after 6 o'clock in the evening, two adults, two kids, as we've been saying, when it went into the water near Berth 73 and sank upside down, submerged in 30 feet of water to the harbor floor. Paramedics did arrive within three minutes, we're told. Witnesses saw the man and woman, presumably the mother and father, make their way out from the wreckage. They were then seen floating in the water and heard screaming for help. As it settled into the in, to the bottom, it, it causes it disturbs all the silt, so the visibility is very difficult. They they had a very hard time uh, the extricating the second patient out. Yeah, it's a good description of the most of the harbor is zero visibility as the divers uh, work to do that extrication. Uh, ultimately, all four patients were transported to local hospitals, and it was an eight and a 13 year old in the back of the car that were ultimately rescued in a grave condition, um, but a real tragedy. And I think uh, uh, the chief knows that area, the port, very well. It normally has a number of ob obstructions in that area to keep cars from driving there, but in this case, I think it was a kind of a wide open shot and just a, kind of an anomaly. But, uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Thank you chief. You. Um, verbal report by the medical director for the same time period, April 8th, April 21st. Uh, good morning, commissioners. Good morning. Good morning. Just to echo uh, some of the comments by Chief Rueda and Chief Terrazas on the, uh, the tragic incident of the car into the harbor. Uh, sadly, the 8-year-old and the 13-year-old uh, boys ultimately succumbed to their injuries mm -hmm. due to uh, prolonged downtime and lack of oxygen, uh, despite the heroic rescue attempts by firefighters. So particularly tragic, uh, both the parents uh, did well. Um, on the 12th of April in 93's first then, there was a motorcycle versus auto. The motorcyclist actually went uh, broadsided a car, went actually went through the car, resulting in the death of the motorcyclist and the driver. Uh, another tragic incident, uh, looks like a likely suicide on the 13th and 12th first then, a, a person stepped in front of a train, uh, was appeared to be killed instantly. Uh, on the 16th, there were a total of uh, five victims of uh, gunshot wounds spread out, mostly in the Palms area during uh, daytime hours, with uh, one DOA and a second patient only succumbing to his injuries and the three other critical patients, resulting in a tactical alert for the PD. Um, on the uh, 17th, there was a large traffic accident early morning hours in 98th first in uh, Foothill and Paxton, with a big rig coming off the 210 at high speed, rear-ending a number of uh, vehicles total of five patients and uh, one uh, driver pronounced uh, DOA on scene. And then uh, this morning, and our air ops folks can tell you more about that, there was a car over the side of Porter Ranch and 8th First Inn. About an hour ago, a uh, female dr uh, driver went about 150 feet uh, over an embankment wow. off of Cessnon. Uh, miraculously, she appeared to have minor injuries, but it was a pretty long, uh, complex operation, a uh, litter basket and uh, air ambulance uh, assisting to extricate this woman over the side. Mm. Uh, that concludes my report. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, for, for reports of the fire chief for this? Oh, oh 2C and 5G. Okay, we do have a public comment from Dr. Daniel Wiseman, MD, oh in relation to the report from the medical director. Thank you, Madam Chair, and all Thank here. You. Hello, Jimmy. Yeah, no, I've Jimmy, seen you. I haven't seen you in a long time since. I know it's been a while. Commissioner with our neighborhood council. Mm -hmm. I'm here to first of all introduce myself. Some of you know who I am because we've had considerable conversation with the uh, members of your department from the neighborhood council budget advocates. I'm the uh, author of the budget advocates white paper initial document and then it is completed as you know how documents go for the last five years. Now for the last three years we became aware of the difficulties and the shortfall in payment for uh, the medical ambulance services that have been provided and I as a physician am particularly concerned about the fact that this department has not been able to and I know why to charge for the actual medical services that are going on. This year, as you all know, the fire department is going to get almost 10 percent more in funds than they did in previous years. And from what I understand from the mayor's office and from Mr. Krikorian and others, your department is being looked on very favorably this year in comparison to other departments. 
but uh, I see a uh, we originally saw a hundred and eighty million dollar gap in charges versus payments two or three years ago and directed our uh, our comments to the mayor on it at that time we are continuing to do so and this year we're adding to that the fact that the services that the department is providing for medical care whether it's a band-aid on a knee a little reassurance to somebody who's fainted that they're not in serious danger or whether it's the highest level of, of advanced cardiac life support I'm qualified or have been qualified in both of these I've been Thank involved you. in uh, and associated with Thanks for your comment. department may I go on ju for just a moment more uh, please I, I not for it. yeah if you can just wrap it up well the issue here is that we are now actively uh, advocating for your benefit I want to continue to do to interact with members of this department in order to do so the difficulties of who can charge and how much you are paid for Medi-Cal and Medicare that's, are that's well a known really to important me, issue but that is such an <coughs> important issue to you and we're <coughs> taking up that cause right now too thank, thank you, so you much and for we'll me. we'll listen to you uh, you'll be back at 5g so well, I was hoping that this would cover some of that too. okay uh, I made an you can also talk to us offline too well thank all right. I made an offer to Sal to review those cases for you because I am a reviewer for disability cases. Uh, and I think I know what those people are all about. Thank Thanks. Um, moving on to item three, which is presentations. Good morning. Good morning. Madam President, distinguished members of the Fire Board of Commissioners, Fire Chief Tarasas, Madam City Attorney. Ms. Gonzalez, and fire department members and guests. Today, uh, our presentation uh, concerns a uh, rescue that occurred on January 30th, 2015. It was a river rescue in the LA River near the Barham Overpass, and it was of a dog named Lucky. This was a very challenging uh, rescue, as helicopter rescues usually are. Uh, we had a swollen river, we had gusty winds, inclement weather, weather, excuse me, high voltage lines that the pilots had to negotiate around, plus a moving object in the river, obviously a dog. The pilot, Mark Bowman, and the co-pilot, Lance Mesner, were very skillful in the maneuvering of the helicopter to keep it over the dog. The hoist operator, Brent Ruff, did a great job as the hoist operator and uh, the medic that went into the water, John Teresa is here today and we'd like to make a presentation at this time. John? <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is Aeromedic John Teresa on behalf of the members of the Los Angeles Fire Department. We extend our sincere thanks and appreciation to you. On January 30th, 2015, you were part of a hoist mission for a river rescue above the Los Angeles River near the Barham Overpass during a storm where a reported dog was found in the rain-swollen waterway. Your crew operated safely during the storm with wind gusts above high voltage lines and other hazards with accuracy and skill bar none to rescue the dog which was destined to die without human intervention. You skillfully captured Lucky the dog while he attempted to bite you, <laughs> maintained your, yourself steady while perilously exposed to a raging river and safely delivered him to an embankment while dangling on a cable from a helicopter. We commend you and extend to you our personal appreciation for your selfless actions and service to the Los Angeles Fire Department. Your actions truly reflect the highest ideals of the fire service. I didn't know I was going to have to say anything, but uh, <laughs> other than the, uh, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, really just doing my job, you know, and everybody else uh, worked together. It was a team effort, and it's really what we do in the fire department. So thank you. Thanks. Okay. 
I got to add some comments to this. Uh, it's appropriate. Doc, uh, the dog's name was Lucky. <laughs> you know, he's lucky he jumped in the river in the city of Los Angeles with a team on duty that we have with the greatest fire department in the world, the Los Angeles Fire Department. And uh, here's another example of our excellence. You know, people ask, why do we do those things? My concern is if we don't, what if the little boy, little girl who owns that dog jumps in the river after? Yes. Then we have a double tragedy. Um, very uh, uh, dangerous operation. And sometimes we take that for granted because our helicopter team makes it look so effortless and seamless. And I've had multiple incidents with them, and they do amazing work. Uh, I do think it contributes to their high level of training to continue to respond to these types of incidents. And in the future, if they ever have to do it again, they're better prepared because they've done this many times. So, John, I'm very proud of you and your team. Um, I can't say enough good things about you. Congratulations. I'm proud you're a member of our department. Thank you. I'd like to introduce uh, Battalion Chief Pete Bennis, who's in charge of our air operations. Yeah, I just want to reemphasize a point that uh, Chief Tarasas made. Uh, as the crews, uh, the helicopter crews were flying along the river, there were people starting to climb the fences. And uh, if we hadn't done what we did, if the crews hadn't done, if John hadn't gone down there, somebody else would have, and it would have exacerbated the issue, and now we would have had a person in that uh, raging, swollen river. So. There have been questions asked of why are we making these efforts to rescue a dog. And, uh, of course, if you ask the dog that question, uh, he would give his answer. But it, it is, a, it is a, a heroic effort by our members, and, and they did an outstanding job. And, and Chief DeRossa's point, these guys make it look easy. But I can tell you the hours and hours and hours of practice and drilling that goes into these type of rescues is tremendous. And uh, they are to be commended for their efforts and uh, uh, greatly appreciate all the work that they do. So. Commissioners? Uh, so, returning to the agenda, um, item four is a consent agenda item. And um, there is an item on the regular agenda item, which is 5F, which I think should probably go on the consent agenda. Yeah, um, uh, we can add uh, 5F as well as, um, I was going to add 5B in as well, unless there's any objection. Um, 5B going on the consent also? Okay. All right, so I'm going to move the uh, consent agenda items um, 4A as well as items uh, 5B and 5F. Uh, if I can get a second. All in favor? Aye. 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 So that's the consent agenda items. Moving on to the regular <coughs> agenda items. Item 5A is a report by the Department on Training and Support Bureau's Firefighter Candidate Mentorship and Preparation. Uh, information notice. Hi. Good morning, Madam President, uh, Commissioners. Good morning. <coughs> City Attorney, Chief Terrazas. Uh What you have before you is a report the, um, on the Firefighter Candidate Mentorship and um, Preparation Information Notice. It, is, uh, it addresses the Independent Assessor's Report, uh, which was um, heard on uh, August 5th, 2014. It is the <coughs> entitled The Review 
of the recruitment selection and hiring process for the Training Academy Class 131. It addresses recommendation number four, which basically states uh, to develop a notice specifying the methods for mentoring candidates uh, and a reminder of the laws <coughs> and of unbiased selection in the hiring process. The information has been, uh, the information notice has been a collaborative effort uh, basically between um, the Independent Assessor's Office, the City Attorney's Office, uh, Risk Management, and Training and Support Bureau. And I'd like to amend the recommendation from uh, receiving file and that you approve this uh, report that it that we can post it on the information okay. portal. That concludes Thank the report. Thank you. <coughs> I'm looking at her. No, I'm sorry. It's okay. The agenda for this item has the conditions of recommended action to approve the report, but the actual report itself has a recommended action and reduced cost. So oh, okay. Okay. So I move it as amended. That was a second. No second. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. So item 5C is a um, report by the Department on Status and Disposition of LAFD matters considered and referred to City Council committees and departments, et cetera. Madam President, uh, Commissioners, Chief Terrazas, uh, Ms. Ravish, and Ms. Gonzalez, I'm Graham Everett. I'm Assistant Chief, Chief of Staff for the Fire Department and with the Council and Committee activity reports for the dates April 13th through April 21st of this year. Uh, you have some of the actions within your packet. I have a few more that um, came in afterwards that I can share with you today. Uh, Chief, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Dr. Eckstein responded back to a public safety committee report which directed the department to work with LAPD on policies responding to patients with dementia issues. So um, the council adopted a motion that was filed to work together with LAPD on a training program for that effort. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, Dr. Eckstein uh, responded to council to discuss our nurse practitioner program and also funding um, a report back to work with uh, UFLAC, CLA, CAO uh, on the resources needed to develop such a program. In addition to that, we had um, uh, an item today being heard in, in council regarding our Frank Hodgkins uh, Memorial Training Center, which um, uh, it'll be partially for the deed transfer from the U.S. Navy to the fire department. So we're hearing that today as well. That should be going on right now. Um, and lastly, what from a mayor report dated uh, April 16, 2015 for the recommended reappointment for Dr. Hara to the okay. fire commission. So those were the uh, outstanding items from the report that's already in your packet. If you have any questions, I can answer them. Is there budget stuff coming up also? Uh, yes, the mayor's budget was released yesterday, so we're working on the report there, and the budget hearings are on April 29th. Okay. Uh, wh what's the Build LA project? Yeah. I'm sorry, which one are you looking that at? That was um, uh, 150316 there, the third one down. Is a, a Plum report. It's on 4115. So the... Um, I'll have to get back to Chief Vitovich. He represented us on that uh, on the council item. It was approved as it went through. Um, I cannot remember exactly what the the topic of the uh, project was, but I can get back to you on that. Okay, great, thanks. Yeah. Thank you. Anything further? Okay, thanks. Um, so you move to uh, receiving file item five C. All in favor? Aye. Second. Aye. Oh. Oh wait. I got a second. Right? <laughs> second. <laughs> so, uh, item 5D is report by the department relative to the community risk reduction leadership training. Good morning, Madam Good morning. President, members of the commission, city attorney, and it's not Leticia. Sandra. All right. Um, good morning. I just want to give you an update on where we are with the Community Risk Reduction Leadership Project. I know that Commissioner Glazier of um, note has had specific interest in this particular initiative of which 
Chief Terrazas has been thoroughly supportive um, since he came into office as fire chief. And where we are right now is we have entered into a partnership with the Isri uh, Company and the Alchemy Management Solutions Company, which is from the UK, uh, banking on their experience in this particular type of work. We are partnering with them where their staff will come from the UK, come here to Los Angeles and actually train five of our um, people within the uh, department. This will take place in June, from June 15th to June 19th. And the idea that Chief Terrazas has is for this whole model, this concept to become integrated into the four bureaus that exist within uh, the new model of the organization. So there will be representatives from each bureau that will be a part of training, uh, from planning, from fire staff, because there's a big part of the training that involves data analysis, <coughs> and from the Fire Prevention Bureau. And out of that, uh, the uh, particular geographic locations would now be armed with the um, ability to actually do a community risk reduction uh, project. And so ISRI and Alchemy will come and do the training in June, and then they'll come back in the fall uh, once we establish those dates to follow up to kind of see how things are going with the intent of actually institutionalizing this in each of the bureaus so that essentially it would allow a bureau commander to do an analysis in a given community to see what the problems are and in a proactive way to begin to collaborate with community members to build strategies and intervention educational initiatives to address those particular <coughs> problems. So the training does what exactly? Like what are they, what skills are they getting trained so on? So the, the training will actually take everyone through understanding what a community risk reduction um, initiative looks like. So you develop a clear strategy, you understand how to do an analysis of risk within your community. <coughs> you'll understand how to effectively collaborate, which will build on what our Bureau commanders are already doing within their respective areas. We'll understand the value of performance metrics, which is consistent with what Firestat does. We'll understand how to integrate this into our everyday operations, but more importantly, we'll be able to measure the effectiveness and we'll be able to target specific risks in the community. And one of the things that Chief Terrazas is uh, a huge advocate about is doing pilot programs to be able to put something out there to do it and then measure it, make sure it works, and then integrate it in a more fuller way throughout the organization. Uh, um, who, uh, who have you selected for the, I know it's 15 folks, but who, who will they be? Those names haven't been identified. Uh, right now, uh, we're at the point where um, this will be further discussed and combined ops to get into the specifics of who the bureau commanders want represented at this particular training. However, there is a portion of the training that will allow for uh, members of the fire commission, the fire chief, elected officials to come and gain an understanding about the value of this type of work. Yeah, um, and just to be clear, I'm, I'm uh, um, l less interested in the actual names and more just about how we're going to select uh, who, who the right position of people are to be there. Um, I know, you know, within the, the bureau system, we're talking about having resiliency um, officers within each each center, which I think is great. Um, you know, I, I, I think it, it is, um, if this is going to be an effort that's going to be sustainable, as I'm, I'm sure you know, uh, having the right people in the room who are going to be able to really carry forward the mission yes, sir. Um, is critical. And you know, I think we, I think the, the reorganization um, will be a huge advantage for us because we're going to be able to have people, um, we're able to select people who can be spread out, who can be in those positions for um, for several years and really implement what we're talking about. But, you know, the other thing I would say is, I, you know, um, and, you know, we've talked about this, and I know you're thinking about this as well, but just, just to um, say it again, you know, uh, to make sure we have the right balance of, of our, our EMS risk reduction as well as, you know, f uh, fire risk reduction. You know, as I was talking with um, – uh, I was at a firehouse the other day, and was, you know we were, we were discussing the fact. You know the the strides we made in in fire reduction. You know there's a reason why we have vastly fewer fires now, and that's because of building codes, and it's because of inspections and um, and education. And imagine if we were able to take that same level of risk reduction on the medical side, as far as um, 
primary, you know, encouraging people to get primary care or um, or having, uh, you know, insurance or education on when to call 911, when not to call 911. You know, um, and, you know, the, the, the amount of time and energy you put on the fire side has really paid off. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing how that risk reduction aspect comes in to this, um, this process as well. Um, yes, sir. Because I know that they all they all kind of go together. Yes, sir. Um, but yeah, I think really making sure we have the right people in the room who who you know a mixture of people who have you know expertise in in both the AM, uh, or some in the EMS, some in the fire set, or both um, will be great. I'm really looking forward to seeing how this goes, and then coming out of this, um, seeing our strategy develop and starting to get some you know milestones on paper and and a project plan. So I'm looking yes, forward to seeing how that goes. Yes, sir. Great. We'll thank you. That. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, that concludes my report. Thank you. Uh, receive and file. Yep. Move to receive and file item 5D. Second. All in favor, aye. Aye. So moving on to 5E's report by the department relative to the Fire Prevention Bureau's action plan. Is that you? Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm back again. Uh, <laughs> so uh, in the absence of... Uh, Chief uh, Vitovich, who's away at a uh, conference, um, he asked me to uh, report on behalf of the Fire Prevention Bureau regarding the overview and action plan, which was directed by the Fire Commission uh, for us to actually uh, put this type of report together and, more importantly, provide you with some updates. And so clearly within the Fire Prevention Bureau, our vision is to be inspection professionals and also operate as a cohesive team. And with respect to the leadership of Chief Vitovich, uh, much of that has been happening. In fact, uh, a lot of the inspectors and civilians say that change is occurring and it's being uh, done collectively as a team. And it's the mission of the Fire Prevention Bureau to provide all those that come in contact with our staff unparalleled quality service. And customer service is a absolute uh, hallmark of what we continually strive to do and when in fact we miss the mark we fix it. The goals of the Fire Prevention Bureau as it stated in the report clearly says that we are responsible number one for developing a Fire Prevention Bureau strategic plan. Um, with regard to our strategic plan I would say that we're about 95 percent there uh, in terms of uh, rolling that out. With respect to the reorganization of the Fire Prevention Bureau relative, relative to it becoming uh, a contemporary organization and being metric dip driven, both of those are occurring simultaneously. Uh, we are deeply immersed in data and we find that it's of tremendous value in terms of us improving what we do and more importantly providing the inspectors with the tools and the technology to better do their job. And as the reorganization work group completed their work, which they were asked to do in two months, they came forth with a document that Chief Vitovich is now currently reviewing as part of the reorganization of the Fire Prevention Bureau to ensure that we're providing the best service possible. Our third goal is to provide effective service delivery to new construction projects in order to enhance economic development. One of the good things that we've been able to do recently is hire additional uh, fire protection engineer uh, to help us in terms of work that improves the quality of the, um, uh, the uh, so, so we have individuals that come forth with uh, documents that they need reviewed. And so with regard to the fire protection engineers, they actually have been able to help us speed that up so that there's less counter time that someone's um, experiencing and we could actually be more effective in that area. And then the last part is with regard to technology and fire protection systems and testing. One of the things that we implemented is a partnership with a company called Bricer and it's a compliance engine system that is now allowing us to be more efficient and effective with regard to our chief regulation for compliance. So we're able to see where some of the gaps are. We're working toward filling those gaps and ultimately is going to improve overall what we've been doing over the last number of years within the Fire Prevention Bureau. This report also has several other items in it uh, for your uh, review and it has 
uh, percentages of completion. I will tell you that it's ongoing, that it's all hands, and that all members are involved in some way, form, or fashion of the work that's being done in the Fire Prevention Bureau. And that concludes my report. Great. So uh, I just wanted to com commend the, the department on, on the work you're doing on this. I think this is um, uh, the right way to be doing this. Um, and I'm, I'm pleased to hear there's um, collaboration happening with um, members uh, uh, of, you know, with the inspectors and, and all the way up and down there. I think that's, you know, this is going to be a problem that, that we solve collectively. Um, if I could just make a request, when we get to June um, and you bring your um, performance management uh, and um, and your some of the other things I think do in June. But um, I would love to see an update on how we are doing with our backlog. Um, I think what spurred, I think, some of this conversation was the fact that we had a really significant backlog in a number of our inspection areas. Um, and I am in interested to see um, in June where that backlog is. Yes, um, you know, I know that there was some obviously more there than was going to be handled within six months. Some of them were 18-month backlogs. Um, but uh, those that have not been erased yet, um, I am interested to see what we should be expecting at that point. And um, I think at, at that time, um, I think Chief Vitovich, last time we talked about it, seemed to feel comfortable that he would be able to make some projections at that point about how we were going to be able to start um, uh, get, you know, eliminating that backlog and uh, getting caught up. So just, if you could just make a note that in that June time frame, I uh, would like the commission to get a report on yes, sir. that backlog. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And if there's no other questions, that concludes. Maybe this yes, ma'am. question maybe goes to the chief. I'm not sure. <coughs> At one time, we had those vacancies for our inspectors. So is that being eliminated, or, or how are we on that? There's a lot of things going on in the Bureau, as Chief Cooper said. I ride the elevators every day with inspectors, and I ask how it's going, and I get a consistent theme that a lot of change going on. And that's a good thing. Uh, we're using a lot of tools to um, drive performance. One of those is to request to fill vacant positions that have been vacant for years. We are promoting six Inspector 2s next month. Uh, we're leveraging technology such as Bryce or the Chief Cooper talked about to increase our efficiency. We have a, a strategic plan, <coughs> excuse me, on my desk from the Fire Prevention Bureau to move forward in a coordinated fashion to improve our productivity. Part of that is a, a reorg of the Bureau as well. Unfortunately, because of the economic downturn over the recent uh, years, uh, the Fire Prevention Bureau has gone without positions and support, and we're trying to turn that around as we speak. And we're making good incremental positive progress. Mm -hmm. That's good. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, move to receive and file item 5E. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. So a last item is a verbal report on super users partnerships with Los Angeles County Health Nurse Practitioner Response Unit and Medical Director. Good morning again. Good morning. Uh, yeah, this is just a uh, status update on our Nurse Practitioner Response Unit program. Oh, that was fast. All right, you're out of time. Thank okay, you. thank you. Talk a little more, a little more quickly. Uh, I'm pleased to report that the uh, Nurse Practitioner Response Unit proposal, which was initially uh, submitted to the Innovation F uh, Mayor's Innovation <laughs> Fund, uh, was unanimously approved by Council last week. So it's been fully funded for a 12-month pilot. Mm. We're in the process now of working through the various city departments and uh, personnel to get the position of Nurse Practitioner Supervisor approved through the CAO and personnel. And we hope to bring on the Nurse Practitioner by July 1st. And we're also in the process of selecting the paramedic to be the partner with the nurse practitioner, working on logistics right now in terms of purchasing the uh, medical equipment, uh, working on policies and procedures, and finalizing our selection for what battalion uh, the nurse practitioner response unit will be located. As you might imagine, the uh, op-ed piece in LA Times last week has generated a tremendous amount of interest from uh, healthcare providers and colleagues around the country. And uh, a lot of individuals are looking to see uh, how we're going to uh, move forward on this program, and I'm very optimistic that uh, our nurse practitioner response model uh, pilot will serve as a model for the nation, and I think we'll, the data will be very compelling uh, that it should be funded and, and expanded in many other neighborhoods throughout the city. 
Uh, again, two-pronged approach. One is to address specifically the so-called super users. We have about, about the top 40 of our uh, so-called EMS super users accounted for over 2,000 incidents last year. So it's tying up emergency resources. It's a uh, significant negative impact on morale of our, of our members responding to the same individuals over and over again and thus having perhaps delayed response times on true emergencies. And we're not providing a real service to these patients because it's, um, they have no medical home. We're not providing definitive care, and that's literally a revolving door. So the Nurse Practitioner Response Unit will work specifically with these super users whom we've identified through our EMS database and work with the various stakeholders throughout the city and county and state in terms of uh, uh, getting these people into a medical home, substance abuse programs, mental health programs, and we're already initiating contacts with a number of stakeholders, including law enforcement, public health, and mental health and, and county health uh, throughout the area even before we launch the Nurse Practitioner Response Unit. The other portion of their time will be spent uh, upon request of on-scene field resources to uh, provide a, comp a very rapid, comprehensive uh, treat and release medical evaluation on scene to obviate the need to transport very low, acu low acuity patients. So I'm extremely um, optimistic uh, about the success of this program and very appreciative of the support of Chief Terrazas, uh, Council Member Englander, and the City Council at large and the Fire Commission as well as UFLAC. Uh, I think this will be very well received and will be embraced by our members and this could be a real boon to our patients and also the so-called super users uh, hopefully get some of these individuals the uh, definitive help that they need. And I'll certainly help, happy to entertain any questions you might have. So who um, logistically, are, is, is the nurse practitioner an LAFD employee? Are they, you know, from county public health? Or are they temporary? How is it being set up right now? So uh, excellent question. So the nurse practitioner will be hired as a full-time city employee. So uh, our fire administrator is working diligently with various city agencies to fast track this position uh, as being created. And uh, I met with the personnel yesterday. So the uh, optimistic timeline is to have this individual on board by July 1st. So the individual will, will report to me. Uh, he or she will be a full-time city employee, um, very, very well qualified, and works one, a full-time effort for the nurse practitioner response unit. So will that person be hired by the personnel department the same way they hire everybody else? <clears throat> I mean, they go through an application, there's an open application process, uh, whatever, however the personnel department handles hiring city employees? Uh, I don't believe so, ma'am. Um, we have a uh, nurse practitioner uh, who's been working with me to help develop this project for about the last year, who's extremely qualified, uh, is actually a nurse practitioner supervisor at USC. He's also a certified vocal intensive care nurse. He has a doctorate um, and has an interest a, as a career to help get this program off the ground and help, uh, and help build it to be the success that I believe it will be. Oh, okay, I see. Um, do, do, <coughs> do you, can you tell me which battalion has the most super users at this time? Uh, yes, ma'am. The battalion with the most super users right now, not surprisingly, is Battalion 1, uh, which includes uh, Skid Row, which has the num largest number of homeless individuals. Um, however, as you, I'm sure you would agree, the uh, homeless individuals pose significant challenges in terms of combination of homelessness, mental health issues, and substance abuse issues. So we're likely going to choose a different battalion to start. We want to have some early successes. Um, I will probably finalize the decision of what battalion we're going to launch this program in within the next few weeks. But I think to start in battalion one would pose not insurmountable, but very, very significant challenges due to the high percentage of uh, homeless population that account for our super users. Overall, our top 40 super users, about two-thirds are homeless. Uh, surprisingly enough, a fair number of these patients do have some type of insurance, but if, if the bulk are uh, homeless, it poses um, incredibly difficult challenges to locate them, work with them, and, and get them help. Our, our preliminary data shows combination of substance abuse and mental health problems are prevalent with these individuals. So the amount of time that has to be vested to help even one of these individuals will be considerable. Um, I think if we start in an area that has a, a large number of super users but a lower percent of whom are homeless, I think we'll be able to achieve much more significant results in a shorter period of time, particularly for the pilot program. Not to say we're not going to deal with these patients. Uh, battalion then is number two. That's outside of the home. I understand this issue with the homeless yes, because you need a team of people, right. not just a nurse practitioner, to go in there. Right. Um, 
Which one is number two? Uh, number two, I believe, is Battalion 5 is Hollywood. And, um, but they also have a large homeless. Don't they have? Correct. That's, 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 that's correct. And then uh, probably Battalion 13. I'm also exploring uh, uh, opportunities to perhaps work with mm -hmm. the uh, MLK, which is about to open in, uh, in June. Mm -hmm. My understanding is that whole new complex is really designed for uh, outpatient preventative care. Mm -hmm. So that might be a great opportunity to partner and collaborate with the county and UCLA who will be running the uh, <coughs> MLK complex. So um, we hope to finalize that selection in the next few weeks. We want to make it a place where we can help the most number of people in the shortest period of time, typically Which for the pilot. would include Martin Luther King Hospital? That would be Battalion 13. 13, okay. Thank you. Actually, just a point of edification uh, for, you know, uh, <laughs> the non-medical people. Um, the non -doctors? This, yeah. There, there, there's an entity called dual diagnosis. You know, there's comorbid psychiatric diagnosis and dual diagnosis, which is a combination of substance abuse and a psychiatric disorder. E even though a lot of times we focus on the mental health disorder, the reality is until you've taken care of the substance abuse issue, you don't even s begin to tackle the mental health disorder. Um, so, uh, so it'll it's be really for homeless people. That so it'll be really and it'll be really important that you know the, the partnership uh, includes a number of uh, agencies that deal with substance abuse before you can start deploying the uh, mental health uh, uh, pr you know professionals. And we are looking at some best practices. We visited uh, San Diego, which has been very successful in their program with uh, chronic alcoholics. Mm -hmm. uh, we're visiting, uh, going down to Anaheim tomorrow. They're starting a, a similar program in Anaheim. We've uh, also been part of um, uh, the District Attorney Lacey's program for, uh, to address the similar patient population. I've also had several meetings with LAPD Mental uh, Evaluation Unit, who runs a smart team, who so have uh, of their 90 full-time employees, half are uniformed, half are mental health and public health uh, experts. So we're already making a number of uh, inroads and, and, and tend to collaborate with the various stakeholders. But clearly the super users is, is, a, is a, a population that we want to provide these people the help they need, which would free up our resources exponentially. So, um, so first, I just want to I want to thank all the parties involved here. I know this was a lot of work to get this off the ground, and and would not have happened without the support of our chief um, and and the work of Dr. Eckstein and and several of your colleagues. But I, I just want to note that uh, let's not understate the magnitude of this moment because this is huge. Um, this is the first time in I think well, I, since certainly since I've been here um, that we are rethinking an approach to uh, um, to a, a huge uh, number of our the, the, the people that we serve um, reconsidering how we are deploying resources H however small that reconsideration is um, the fact that we were able to have uh, UFLAC in support and council member support and the mayor to support and the and the chief this is a really big deal um, it, and it, it is the beginning I think of our department recognizing that things have changed in the world and that we can't continue to do things exactly the way we've always done them. And so we're trying something new. Um, and it's hard to try new things, um, but it's a really big deal. And um, I, I couldn't be more excited about this. I think it's, uh, I think it's tremendous because I, I think not only is it an opportunity for us to um, try something different that will ultimately benefit not only the people we serve, but also the members of this department um, because they're, they're going to be able to uh, you know, be it will bring some efficiency. It will you know it will address some of the issues that I think really do cut up morale um, uh, for for some of our members. Um, but it also gives us an opportunity to collect data um, and understand different modes of treatment. Um, it will allow us to understand um, how we serve the population we serve better. Uh, it's a basis for collaboration that we have not had. And you know, I think w one thing I want to say, just to push this even further, is as we are rolling this out, let's not let's let's always think about different ways we can continue to position ourselves as leaders in this problem. Because as, as I said before, um, we are part of the public health system, and considering, and, and this is a great a great kind of a connective tissue, if you will, between us and the public health system. Um, and I think there's just a ton of potential there. But we have to take this moment and turn it into a leadership opportunity for us to be leaders in the county in terms of how we are addressing these things. And it gives us the opportunity to go to folks in the public health system and say, look, 
here is what we are doing. These are the issues we are facing. This is how we need to collaborate so that collectively we are serving our population better um, and serving ourselves better. Uh, and we can use that as a platform for advocacy to start saying, look, this is a model that works. It is a more efficient way to deliver service. It benefits our ability to respond to major emergencies because it keeps our resources um, uh, free for, for major emergencies. Um, but, you know, we, we need to have this as a – this needs to be seen as, as the right approach, and we have the opportunity to do that. Um, so I, I'm really looking forward to seeing what the results are for this and seeing how this develops in terms of us um, becoming le um, a leader not only in our city but in the country in terms of our approach to um, what, what is – uh, a problem everywhere, and um, as, as our former superintendent of the schools, you could say, um, Los Angeles is is tomorrow nationally only sooner. Um, and you know, we are seeing, we're, we're, we are, we are, it, it puts us on the cutting edge of the approach. And so, I, I really think um, I really want to commend all the work that, that's been done here, and um, and I just want to make sure we, we don't lose sight of the momentousness of what we're trying here. So thank you so much. Yeah, and the critical success, uh, you know, the critical element of success is really identifying a nurse practitioner who gets it. And I think uh, Dr. Eckstein has identified that individual who already is engaged in the whole process. And, and, and I think that's that's going to be the key. And, and I, so I, I think we're, we're going in the right direction for sure. So I want to <coughs> underscore, you know, everything that, all the commissioners have said, and Dr. X seems so important. If there's any little bit of a damper on this, is that I wish it was longer, because I know it's only six months. Uh, Twelve months, ma'am. It's oh, it's 12 months. Yes, oh, okay. I thought it was six. Okay, good. Um, and hopefully there'll be, you know, because even in 12 months there's going to be glitches, um, and we should expect that. But I think I, I wish that we would have this long-term commitment to it to see it through. Um, so hopefully it'll be included in next year's budget either way um, so that we can have like long-term data and just you know even if we don't get it perfectly right the first time <coughs> that we can innovate it we can figure out something else that will work eventually but yeah. you know just I'm very excited about it I think all of us are thank you a couple other uh, comments so I promise public safety we'll come back with quarterly reports we're gonna have quite a bit of robust data we've come up with a separate electronic patient care report template specific for the nurse practitioner program with that expanded scope of practice and the echo Commissioner Glazier's comments I think while the pilot program really is for to demonstrate safety and efficacy I think this really does represent a paradigm shift the way we do business um, and I think the ultimate goal, my vision for this program is to really create a, a mobile integrated health program, MIHP, -I -I Mobile Integrated Health Program, because the fire department now uh, is really playing a pivotal role in public health, mental health, substance abuse, uh, preventative care, and just putting more ambulances out there and taking the patient from point A to an over, overly crowded emergency department um, is not helping anybody. Um, so we need to free up our members to do what they're expert in, which is stabiliz resuscitation and stabilization, and try to offset some of the low acuity patients and, and get some of the super users out of the EMS system into definitive care. So I appreciate your support and comments and look forward to coming back after the program's launch with preliminary data. Great. Okay. Just, I'd like to add a few comments to this as well. Number one, I agree with the Commissioner Glazier. This is a big deal. Sometimes we forget in the middle of all this change going throughout the department that we take this for granted. But as we drill down on the numbers, and uh, the doctor shared the stats with our top 40 users, it was evident real early that we weren't addressing their problem. Bottom line, we were not addressing their problem. And I know of one instance where one caller called us six times uh, in one day. In one day. In one day. And then um, we six times we failed that person because we didn't have other options. This program will give us options to drill down to the root cause of why that person called us. And I have to commend Dr. Eckstein. He's been uh, an innovator. Um, whenever I came to him with an issue and an idea, he was already ahead of me. He had already thought about it. He'd been waiting for the opportunity. In fact, uh, when I met Bob Stone from the Mayor's Innovation uh, Team, I suggested we make the EMS Division an innovation center. And without, within minutes, he agreed after I told him what we were doing. We have three innovation centers within the fire department. We have the shops. We have Dr. Eckstein's shop. And we have the Fire Prevention Bureau. There's only 15 citywide. We have three of those in our department. I'm very proud of that. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Eckstein, thank you. We're, we're not across the finish line. We're just at the start of the race, but now we have the right tools to win the race. 
thank you for everything you're doing. We really appreciate it. Thank you for your support. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank um, you. If I might just oh, yeah. I also compliment you on this process. And I think that, as the commissioner stated, this is a, such a perfect timing because we have the chief, we have the mayor, and the city council. And so I'm happy to see that we're going to use this. And I look forward to the successes of such a program. Not only would it free up um, our equipment and our, our staff, but it will also free up emergency rooms because I hear the comments about the emergency rooms on a personal basis very regularly. Um, and so this will help to free up spaces in those emergency rooms for people who are really sick. So I appreciate the effort that you're doing. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So I know I actually need it because it's a verbal report. And we don't have any public comments because I think Dr. Wiseman left, right? Okay, too bad. <laughs>